Slap on the wrist. Stay. Oh, no. I'm not even getting close to telling you about how he is at work. I'm mm. fine at work. Yeah, I'm doing my work efficiently. Yeah. I'm doing the best. I trust you. I don't do my work efficiently. Why do you, you keep throwing pizza at children? Hmm? Is she actually done? No, Zane, come back here. No, I work at Pizza Hut. I work with Tommy's though. He's the cook and I'm the server. Like we have a manager that literally said she wasn't she didn't think they could talk to you. Yeah, she so excited. I just got a bad band. Oh, yeah. Who here likes free stuff? Just in general. Exactly. Okay, so what's some resources that we use for granted every day? Water. Air. Water. Air. Hour. Yes. Water. Hour. Exactly. Lumber. Love. I still hate that. Even lives. <laughs> what's that? <laughs> so my name is Ken Sandoval, and my topic is the environmental science and zoology of animals. So this is just an outline of what I'll be covering. So real briefly what ISM is, and what the Amazon is, what harms it, why it's uh, being harmed, the animals of there, and then the dangers if the Amazon were to just disappear. And then I will go into the mass extinction, which will tie to my project. And then I will real talk way at the end. Okay. So what exactly is ISM? It's basically a class where you, like in the simplest term, terms you get to uh, choose a topic you want and then but um, ask you to have an academic pr purpose to it so let's say if you want to study dust bunnies you would have to know like what is a dust bunny is it really a dust or a bunny and you will find out all the causes it did like just everything about that topic and um, it's mandatory to have a mentor uh, you technically could survive without one but you stuck at a perpetually 80 or lower and they really help you network and you know, help um, get to know people. And so the whole project, you just um, work on the presentation uh, for the end of your year practicing, but you do have different assignments that go along to assist you. My mentor is Mrs. Fox, and she is a environmental science and anatomy teacher. And I just want to thank you because before I uh, went to the class, I was already excited filling it out on the course card, and I wanted to, um, feel like it was a mentor, like any other class, if I even needed it for a credit, I would you know, probably do that during the summer because I really uh, love environmental science. And I always thought I knew so much about nature, but like once I went in your class, I realized like, wow, there's, we're harming the world way more than I thought. But at the same time, we are doing way more than previous expected to. So, thank you, Mrs. Fox. What is the Amazon? The, on, the only most biodiverse place in the world, with one in six animals belonging to it. And so I have those little ones. So three out of that group all belong to the Amazon. And the ones that are very <laughs> And the, I love all biomes, all nature, but Amazon is my personal favorite, just because all the uh, reptiles and just how much life there is. And um, the cool thing is that they, it does provide you 20% of oxygen of the world. So jungles in general, all of them together, is 40% of your oxygen, but just Amazon alone carries half of that. And I do want to eventually visit this place, and I'm hoping it's still there, like most of it. And I know there's a bunch of parasites and diseases there, because, you know, mosquitoes, but that's just another example of how biodiverse it is. So this is the Amazon's main problem, is the deforestation. So all that not dark green is cut away. And I always thought, like when I was younger, I always thought um, forests were just cut, well, like the Amazon was for timber. But I was wrong, and it's not for its need either. It is for agriculture, especially cows. Cows take so much land, and the reason is, besides the fact that they eat so much, is the three main um, 
I guess crops were you raised. So it's cattle, then there's soy, which is the feed for the cattle, and then there's palm oil. And palm oil is like the worst this globally. Like Asia is really having trouble with palm oil. And so if we were, you know, just to eat the soy, like the actual food of the feed, we would save so much more land. But the reason uh, Brazil sells so much cattle is because they are the second highest exporter of them. And I'll get into more why cows are bad. Yeah. So here's all the good drops at trees. Dude. Everyone knows the first two. So what what does everyone know about trees? Like, so those are the two primary that everyone knows. So photosynthesis and respiration. And remember, uh, plants also do respiration, so they do release CO2. But the whole Amazon, every year, I believe it was, they release 1.9 billion uh, tons of CO2, but they take in 2.2. So it, it um, they take 0.3 out. And this is uh, that diagram, just different parts of the tree that show a lot of different amounts of CO2 they have. But here's some other jobs that trees do because there's a lot more. So one is they control like the climate and the weather. So in the Amazon, it's usually around 85-ish degrees, give or take, and it really doesn't fluctuate because, um, you know, they keep the humidity, everything stays the same. And they, um, okay, desert. Okay, so think of a desert, which is like the complete opposite. In one day, it could go from over 100 to like negative 20, and that's because there's nothing like protecting it from the weather. But in Amazon, all year round, there's technically a wet and dry season, but um, it's kind of hard to tell. Like, there's still a lot of rain. There's a rainforest, and so there's basically anything lives here has all its necessities set for it, except for salt. Salt's a little hard for animals to go there, so they always compete for it. And then they also uh, that's pretty much the worst thing for animal here is competition because there's so many animals. And um, so trees, they actually, uh, you know, like I said, protect with weather. So in the Florida mangrove swamps, there's still some there, but most of them are gone. It's because people thought they were too scary looking, so they took them away. But what they, like, if they knew is that if you were to keep them there, the hurricanes that hit, like, Harvey or all the previous ones, less people would have died because they would have. Uh, weaken the hurricanes. And trees do filter out pollutants, so any pretty much all the natural greenhouse gases, so you got ozone and CO2. And they actually um, filter out lead, which I found was cool, so I didn't, I didn't know they could do that. And they keep soil together, so they keep the oceans from taking away. And there's, they're really good. And uh, one thing I found out from an ACT essay was that trees actually psychologically just make you happier. And then any environment where you grow up with more plants and life, there's less crime rates and there's less people with depression. You know, we involved with trees, we, we, I guess, yeah, we just grew up with them, so it's programmed into us. But the main thing that trees are good for are habitats. Okay, so 75% of the animals in the Amazon actually live in trees. So right here, you got yourself the tomadua, which is the lesser anteater, it's really adorable. Then you got over there a two-toed sloth, which is actually faster than the three-toed one, and it's nocturnal. <laughs> you got yourself the red green macaw, you got your little adorable squirrel monkey, but never have them as pets, because they do bite and they're highly aggressive. Uh, you got yourself a harpy eagle, which has a large talon size of any bird and prey. So its talon is actually the size of the grizzly bear paw, oh. and it, if it really wanted to, it couldn't rip your face off. And um, so they eat sloths and monkeys, but um, if there's some cases where it actually got some toddlers, so you know, watch your kids. And they even had mangrove tree climbing crabs. I didn't know. It's so oh, cool. that's a crab? Yeah, it's crab. Like, I don't even know how to they could climb that, but it's so cool. What's that image there with the water? So cool. Oh, that's a weird turtle. I'm, I'm just um, showing the how different, so like usually when there's roots, this isn't in any environment. Uh, fish tend to have their, the kids stay in here and they kind of just, you know, they're state protected, so it's just more habitat examples. But now to get into um, animals, 
got your pet, the gentle, which is the third largest cat in the world with the strongest bite force of 1,350 pounds PSI. So for each inch, that's how much weight it is. And the cool thing about these cats is that instead of like, you know, most mammalian predators where you go for your uh, juggler, these actually like pouncy behind you and bite you at the back of the skull. So, you know, nice and that. And the, um, it turns out, I didn't know this, but they used to be all the way up north to Arizona, but they went extinct there because of poaching, which um, actually um, the sites made it um, illegal now, so they, they uh, don't do it as often because, you know, people are still going to do so. But now their main issue is with agriculture, and this is why. So imagine, you know, you're just a jaguar, you have all your land to yourself, you're like, mm, this piece of like being, you know, top dog. And all of a sudden, you get these trees and cut down, and you're like, well, that's kind of, like, I'll just ignore it for now. So you keep on eating, but your land gets smaller, and then you're realizing, well, I'm running out of food. But look over there, that's big, beefy steak. So let me go eat it. So it eats the livestock, and then, you know, old farmers don't like that. And then this is happens <laughs> with any uh, large predator and the world that uh, farmers will kill animals that kill their cattle. And some even get, uh, go on revenge strikes, so they'll just go out and kill like as much as they can. So, Jaguar, he's threatened, so he's not well, vulnerable. So he's not um, on the worst states, but it's he has a strong uh, paw inside the Amazon. But other places, he's like uh, really endangered. Then you got yourself the Boko, the pink. But, um, okay, so before, their eyes are small because the water is murky, so there's a uh, murky with mercury. Is that, um, so you know, dolphins use echolocation. And they actually have tiny little fillers, so like more senses so they could catch a fish. And one cool thing that I never realized until I learned about this dolphin is that like normal um, ocean dolphins only can move their necks up and down, which I never thought about. But these guys have flexible necks so they could, you know, side to side. There's so many things. So, uh, so with this dolphin, they used to be, well, it depends on like if uh, what tribe, but they see them as mythical animals, so they usually tend up to mess with them. But um, lately, the non-natives, like the Spaniards, they would uh, kill them out of competition, and some even eat them, which is never a good idea to eat any like, ocean or river animal in uh, the water, and I'm gonna tell you why. So, um, first off, let me tell you about all the why agriculture uh, affects these guys too. So you wouldn't think so, because like, oh, hey, they're in the water. But this is how, besides, you know, runoff and all the poisons leaching into the um, water, is that, you know, there's fish that rely on the tree seeds to fall down to, you know, eat, and then the dolphins eat those fish. So if there's no trees there, then there's no nuts, and then there's no fish. That's and people like mining at the riverside with um, to, for gold because mercury um, gets rid of the impurities from gold. But they just let the mercury run into the water, so you know that builds up from uh, little microscopic organisms, and then you know we got your krills, and then your fish, and then basically by the time it goes to a dolphin, it's like a Twinkie but filled with mercury. And just if for y'all who don't know, what mercury is it's a neurotoxin, so it makes you go cray cray. And if you're pregnant, you're, it's gonna have some severe motor skills. They're so cute. They're so funny. Yeah. Um, for a time, these guys were endangered, but then people started farming them, so they're at extremely high numbers now since they're rodents, so they reproduce fast. Um, they're semi aquatic, and basically almost everything eats them. But uh, a good thing is that for some reason, um, a lot of, like, these guys like basking near the riverside, and a lot of animals just like hanging out with them. So you could see some, in a, if you're in the wild, there's birds and turtles, and sometimes even caimans just like all lying next to each other. That's how lovable they are. Green iguana, one of the most dangerous animals I've ever encountered. And here's the reason. Um, besides the fact that they're so adaptable and versatile, they're really good climbers, swimmers, and they, their uh, diet is a wide range of different plants. Um, they are an invasive species because people import them and they're like, oh, look at this beautiful one. But once they get older, they get, um, depending on how female, 
males get really aggressive and then people are like, well, this is six foot loop, it's too much for me, so they let it go. And then, you know, it kills the population. So in Florida, the burrowing owl and the blue, uh, Florida butterfly are, um, they're like the butterfly is almost, uh, it's really endangered them right now because it eats the plants that the caterpillars need to eat. And the only thing that's holding these guys back though is, um, they are from native from like uh, Latin South America, so they're used to the wet and dry seasons. But once they're in America, they're not used to our four seasons, so they freeze. And there's a few cases where they could come back to life, but usually they just freeze and fall off trees and die, or something else could eat them. But with you know global warming, that's only going to extend the range where they're able to go, and then they're going to start taking over other species. So here's the other big animals now. So you got yourself a little tapir, that's a baby. It's like a capybara, almost um, everything eats it, but it's a little bigger. And you can tell by its trunk, it looks like you know an ice age animal. And that's because it stayed mostly the same since uh, when South America first connected with North America. You got yourself the black caiman, which was the largest uh, alligator species. And it grows up to 20 feet and it's, going a little down, it's all right right now, but the other caiman species are out competing and people are like hunting it for its skin too. And um, here you got the big boy giant anteater, which is an interesting looking animal. It has like a grill like body and a strong nose. But don't let them fool you because if you do get them on their bad side because they can't see that well, they will gut you. Because they have huge talons that they could even fend off a jaguar. So don't go picking with the giant out of here. Then you got yourself the green anaconda. The largest, well no, heaviest snake in the world because the reticulated python's only a few feet bigger, even though this snake's like twice as heavy. And so heavy that it spent most of its uh, most of its time in the water because it, it barely can move because it's so beefy. And it loves uh, capybaras, so you know it restricts them often. And they ain't cans. Oh, what's that? <laughs> See, it's an elusive ocelot. I honestly didn't know these creatures existed until I first played Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> they're mid sized cat. They're widespread across uh, South North America and then South America, but they're white and not widespread, so they're sparsely um, distributed. And they are pretty keen, but they are really good at um, hiding. And but since they are small, they can be eaten by larger predators such as the hartebeest. What is the dark frog? Um, okay, so poison dark frogs. Everyone pretty much knows them, but uh, the golden one is the worst one. If you you know just never eat it or touch it with an open sword, and if you know it has enough poison in its little body to kill ten men, so that's nice. Um, what was it called? So, um, oh, so they're only poisoned because of the food they eat. So the ones like at the zoo, those don't have any poison in them. So they're perfectly safe and they still have their cool colors. They all just grow up everywhere. Um, and bullet ants, they're the world's most painful insect thing. Not the most dangerous. The most dangerous is the Japanese hornet, which is a thing of nightmares. But the cool thing about these bullet ants is that, let's say if you know, you're just strolling around in the jungle, which you shouldn't do, and then uh, you're over a bullet ant colony, they're gonna look down at you and you're like, hey, you're an intruder. So they jump down, hiss, fall on you, and sting you. And so the reason I put, uh, put these two animals together is because um, natives use both, both of them. So they use poison darts, you know, for hunting. It's like a one shot, one kill. And then some tribes to become a man you have to put these gloves on for, let's say, like about 10 minutes, full of bullet ants. Which I say you earn it if you could survive that long, but that's the thing. But speaking of natives, <laughs> oh, okay, that was a dark but, um, but um, natives, they do have access to healthcare and education, and things do go better socially if they are the ones in charge of it instead of having the higher power do it for them. And they uh, should be protected, you know, because they're people. You don't want another trail of tears. And, oh. <laughs> um, what was it? Oh. 
But besides that, is that, uh, you know, the fact that people, is that zoologists and botanists actually go to these chieftains and shamans because they, even though they have their own spiritual um, definition of why these certain flora fauna do their things, it usually has a science background to it. So, um, you know, one in four medicines actually originate from the Amazon. And there's so many potential of these plants and even like snake venom or scorpion venom, just any of these animals that could possibly uh, cure diseases that we don't have for human cancer. So that's why it's important to you know, really keep them alive. And 33% of them is already gone since the 1900s. And the reason is because uh, their land gets taken away by either oil booms or you know people want that beef. And then, uh, Oh yeah, and you know, they're still kind of, uh, I'm pretty sure they have a little more resilience than when uh, Christopher uh, first came over, but there's still some diseases that they're not completely immune to, so that uh, it, uh, continues to decline. Okay, so now the effects of deforestation. So basically all the good things I said, it's not those things. <laughs> and, but let me show you with the, um, uh, so this is a positive feedback with wildfires. So let's say, you know, you cut these trees, it gets a little drier and then boom, big lightning strike, and that's a wildfire. And then that spreads, kills more trees. Oh no, the place is getting more drier. So then like it doesn't need like a big lightning strike anymore then or any other fire causing thing. And then the fire keeps on going and it just keeps on getting worse the drier it comes in. And that could severely cripple the ecosystem. And so like I said before, it was one fifth of our oxygen. So Imagine if all our jungles were just gone. So, okay, everyone take a deep breath like that. So, imagine, you know, you're just working out or somewhere where you can't breathe and you're unable to breathe that much because there's less oxygen. And if you have lung disease or asthma, it's good luck. <laughs> so, a treeless world is not a pretty world. And I mean, this, um, to, so a lot of CO2 would be released, but let me tell you about CO2 real quick, is that like CO2, like most things, too much or too little of it is a bad thing, but right now we have too much. And the reason is, okay, so we got ourselves CO2, got these cars. So imagine, I used to always think like biofuels was bad too, because it's, it's, but it's just the same CO2 recycled in the normal, you know, cycle, so death, uh, plants go up, plants eat that, you know, animals eat plants, and then so on. So the CO2 continues. But what fossil fuels is, is CO2 from a bygone age. So we're, it's like we have a bow that just you know keeps on recycling the same carbs, and then we just keep on adding more, and then the world gets you know so many carbs, you're still beast, and then you know all that heat. And but let me tell you why the heat is a bad thing. Besides, you know, uh, it's getting warmer. Um, Okay, so first off, there's some species that are really sensitive, like most um, animals, so they uh, could die from either temperature change or the rise in pH in the water because of the CO2 being dissolved into it. And um, so with the polar ice caps, you know, you would think like, uh, I would always thought like, wouldn't more surface water be good for fish? And uh, it's not the case because with the mix of the fresh water and then the salt water, it messes up the salinity. So unless you're an animal that can survive in any water, which most can't, you will, um, they'll start dying off. And then with the decrease in ice, it's another positive loop because ice has a high albedo effect, which is the amount of sunlight it reflects back into the space. So ice has, I believe it was 90% or higher, and um, ocean water is way lower. So once it keeps on getting warmer, the ice shrinks, and then, you know, just trapping more heat, and then it's another positive feedback into or eventually like an oven. But there is um, a group of organisms that actually love the heat and could anyone guess? Mosquito. Related to that, but yes. But what is a mosquito? Well, it's not be specific. It's a keyword. Parasites? Yes. So parasites and diseases will spread like crazy. And with more of them with the warmer world, because they love the heat, is that you know, there's gonna be some um, high uh, after with all of them since they are our selected species. They're gonna reproduce, and then if we keep on using pesticides, that's gonna 
increase their um, resistance and then we're, uh, there's gonna be some that we can't even do anything about it. And that's why it's always good to leave the ecosystem like as close as to its natural self because usually it fixes itself. It really doesn't um, poison. So my project is about the six mass extinction. And before I get into that, I'll tell you about the previous slide and what is the mass extinction. So it's basically in a short amount of time, relatively speaking, so like a few million years, just the majority of life is gone. So the first one, no one really uh, knows 100% certain on most of them, especially the first one. But um, from a documentary I watched, is that in the Ed Ordovician, it was a supernova that blew up close to our planet. And everything on the land would have been incinerated if there was life on land, but at the time there wasn't. It would just see scorpions and colonoscopies. Mm -hmm. But um, it did kill the surface plankton, and then that made everything starve. And then the food chain shifted because the scorpions used to be at the uh, bottom and the uh, tentacle monsters would eat them, but it switched. Mm -hmm. And um, so that takes us to the late Devonian, which is the age of the uh, armored fish, and the most famous being Duffyosteus, which was the largest predator of its time. And this one was just um, normal climate uh, climate changes. And you got the Ancurian, the Great Dying, the worst mass extinction of all time. And the 95% um, of life went extinct during that short time. So I want you all to picture like everything that's been alive since the dinosaurs when it first started till now was from that 5%. So imagine like how different life would have been if more or less or is a different 5%. I just find it so cool in this small part. And the Triassic period was just a smaller version of the previous one, but it's the one that gave the throne to the dancers. Then they ruled for another 250 million years until everyone knows their story when the K2 extinction. And you know, it's the same thing with this one. If that didn't happen, you know, our little ancestors uh, probably would have never took the spotlight. And I wouldn't be here. I would so this is a six mass extinction. And what makes it different from all the other ones is that it's actually caused by us, a living organism. I know that. And you know, extinction rates are up a thousand times and it's only getting worse. And what um, people don't realize is that we need other life to keep us alive. We can't do it on our own, no matter how advanced we are. We just can't. And you know, it's like a pillar, so I want to show it with this Kerplunk game. So pretend these are different um, biomes. So like usually when you do one or like a tree, it's usually not that bad. But once you start doing a lot over harvesting, oh, that person went extinct. <laughs> and you see that yellow one right there? That's us. Nice. Um, there's some like bees that we know, like without them, life would be way harder. But there's some species that we don't, we don't know at the time into which ones are gone and to work on. So that's why it's important to keep our down. And I recommend watch this documentary. It's really awesome. It's pretty amazing. And just real quick, um, WWF. And that guy Dory does like those Life and Planet Earth documentaries made a new one called Our Planet. And it's amazing, I've been watching it. But um I get back to my mini movie, Six Mass Extinction. So this is how I came up with the idea. Once upon a time I worked as a merch clerk in the San Antonio <laughs> Zoo. And uh, usually I was in the uh, the back uh, gift shop called the Nanuki Market. It's really awesome. And but there's some times where I'll have positions at the carousel. And there's only uh, room for two people, but usually I was uh, alone. And um, it's not really a big gift shop, so normally about 40 there, but um, they always bought tickets. But you have so much free time there that I started talking to the toys. And then, um, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so for some reason, uh, every, uh, every day for like the first month, I was working at the zoo, I'd always buy every day for some reason. And then uh, eventually I stopped because my mom told me to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, never never so, someone stop me through. Um, and then well, well, one time I got uh, picked up by my dad and I was talking to my little brother. He's like, yo, wouldn't it be like a cool but weird idea to explain like, you know, makeshift show? 
and he just stared at me. But uh, <laughs> so one, one day I got you know tired of trying to learn Spanish from reading the Spanish translations of the main text of the animals. That I started writing scripts on the receipts, and some of those I kept. Um, I still have them to the day, and I kept some of the uh, same ones. So this is my process. So first, I got introduced characters, which I which on the next slide. But it's I didn't want to just create a random movie with people you don't know, so I had to um, create other episodes so you know who they are. Then I created a teaser trailer. It's fine. Um, then um, after that comes script writing, which is actually harder than you would think if you want to make uh, things actually good. Then filming down uh, to patience and then editing. Um, so all of them, like, I, you know, it makes sense to, you know, do one after the other, but my work ethic is terrible, so I would just jump around and constantly switch things, add things to the script, and then I would have to um, force myself to do things over. Okay, so here's characters. Just for y'all want to know, we got Giuseppe the giraffe. So you got bones and a primordial form. You got Pinky. You got Timber, Leonard, Clint, Tusk, and Coda. And then my three main ones, all played by me, Caesar, Neon, and Chocolate. <laughs> so, so the shows I, I countered was, you know, motivation. So my. Uh, my brain works really weird, so some days I'll be so determined, I'll get so much stuff done, and then the next day I'll just be like, oh, I just want to lie here. And so I, it was um, hard getting to that point. And then time, time was a big one with, um, okay, I procrastinate a healthy amount. I don't um, do it a lot, <laughs> but it's just that, like, um, I'm preparing to do homework all day because all these um, AP classes, extracurriculars, then the, all the college stuff. It, it was really hard trying to do something I like. And then um, technical difficulties is with um, Premiere. So on these school computers, the video and audio don't always sync up. So it kind of hiccups and it'll go back. And it's so tedious to show it. And you can't watch your videos move until you actually you export it. But that would take another few hours for that to happen. So then you would have to watch that one and then go back and see how good it was. But it was worth it, but it took so much time. And insecurity is, is just like, every once in a while, I'll be like, why am I doing this? Why is a, you know, a young man playing with puppets? And I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's fun, you know? All right, so I, then I'll have to bring myself up. Uh, so, but yeah, those are just challenges. So one thing I did learn time management, still not perfect, but I did get a little better. Um, I learned, I never thought I could, I never like really thought of any leader experience. Like I'm not sure if you ever do the scholarships and ask to like. What are you trying to do? Okay, like, uh, so um, I have this now, so something. But it's um, oh, what's those things change? So uh, originally my product was going to be uh, um, where I uh, have a puppet show in front of elementary students, which I'm still willing to do. I'm going to try to do it after uh, this, and then. So I wanted it to be similar like this, or so for those who were in my class when I did this, so it was just so quick. I don't want to see some of it. We don't want to. Yes. Yeah, that's yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah.
like, you know, once you do it, so that's why I do it with my videos now, but I'm hoping, like, once I'm older, hopefully, after I get my doctors, I want to start teaching any grade of early on here. I just want to uh, spread a word, word for the world. Um, so, uh, it's on, it's teased on Instagram every time they go one, and then I uh, post on YouTube, so that's where it's at. And most of them, like, family and friends watch it. I'm hoping just randomly, some random kid from across the world, for some reason, uh, has a tag for this video and watches it and actually learns something. And then at least try to, you know, just inspires people. Uh, that's how it goes for videos. And this. Okay, so here's my um, trailer for my movie because I do not have the full movie done yet. It's about halfway, but it's like I want it to be 45 minutes and I don't want to rush it. But this is. Too powerful, so let us find a source of his power and make him decompose into the stubborn dust that forms his ghastly bones. What? Okay, let's go research because he is killing our friends, and by friends, I mean almost every living life form on this planet. <laughs> Fellow reptile, this is an urgent global issue. This is because of one species in general humans. That there exists a physical embodiment of extinction. It resembles a undead tyrant, a skeletal rex. I want y'all to scout the different areas and alert the others where you are by yelling and or screaming. I wish you all the best of luck. <laughs> or anything, they usually do monocultures, and monocultures are never a good thing because there's just no diversity. Um, you have to use constant pesticides because there's so many pests, and that only uh, causes 